Hello and welcome back to Good Nightmare, a podcast where we highly value self-care. So make sure you hydrate and check in with yourself today. Today's episode is a follow-up on the previously released episode about Harry Price. It's not absolutely necessary to listen to that episode first, but if you would like a little bit of background on who Price is and how the Borley Rectory case became so famous, definitely give it a listen. A rectory, alternatively known as a priory, is housing provided by a church organisation for a minister, priest or rector to live in. Rectories are often located close to or alongside churches, such as in this case. When Borley Rectory was built in 1862 by Reverend Henry Dawson Ellis, there was no inkling that it would one day become known as the most haunted house in England. The rectory was located in the village of Borley in Essex, England, and was investigated and dubbed most haunted by Harry Price, a British psychical author and researcher. Price was renowned for exposing fraudsters, but it appeared he wholeheartedly believed in the strange occurrences at the Borley Rectory. In fact, he would go on to write two books on the case, which he would become most famously known for. The rectory itself would come to fame upon Price's 1929 visit and the account subsequently published by the Daily Mirror. Price's rival organisation, the Society for Psychical Research, claims to have discredited Price's findings. However, the case remains popular to this day, and in spite of doubts of the haunting being genuine. The Borley Rectory was built to replace a previous structure that had been destroyed by fire in 1841. Reverend Bull would move into the rectory himself the year following its completion. He would have an addition made to the rectory that would act as a home for him and his 14 children. The town of Borley came with a particularly disturbing legend, which some believe may have explained the hauntings in the area, and especially at the rectory. Though there has been no historical basis for the legend, like a lot of lore, It continues to be told. The legend goes that there was once a nun and a monk living in the area. The two fell in love, a love that was forbidden, and they began an affair. When the two were discovered, they were punished in a brutal manner. The monk was executed, and the nun? She was taken to the rectory and bricked into its walls, alive, where she was left to die. The first reported signs of a haunting occurred at the rectory in 1863, when locals claimed to have heard unexplained footsteps. From there, the hauntings intensified, and the witnesses would experience much of the same events. In 1890, July 28, four of the bull daughters living at the rectory believed that they had seen an apparition of a nun only metres away. They tried to approach the figure and attempted to engage it by talking to it. However, they reported that the nun disappeared as they got closer. The children became so acquainted with the nun's presence that they would welcome her and would go searching for her when she didn't appear otherwise. The organist at the rectory reported that the family were, quote, very convinced they had seen an apparition on several occasions though they didn't claim to have seen anything themselves. This owed to the idea that the haunting either only affected the family, or it was some kind of group hysteria, or perhaps not real at all. Over the years, the nun was reported to have been seen by guests of all ages, all walks of life, believers and non-believers in the paranormal. In W. H. Gregson's article, Borley Rectory, the most haunted house in England, he describes the experience as follows. The nun used to gaze through a window in the gloomy dining room. Cheery, hospitable parties around the dining table may have jarred upon her poor, agony-strained feelings. 
Suddenly, a strange chill would creep through the room, a sudden silence fall, and one or other of those jovial diners would glance towards the window, would see there the pale, sad face, coiffed in grey. Those manifestations became so frequent that it was decided to end them by bricking up the window, and this was done. The window was indeed bricked up, and you can see an image of this in the show notes. Since 1890, there were various accounts of witnesses seeing a phantom coach driven by headless horsemen. This account immediately reminded me of the tale of Sleepy Hollow, which features a headless horseman who rides through town disturbing its people. Sleepy Hollow was published in England in 1820, and so had been available for 70 years prior to these sightings. It is possible that these experiences, if untrue, were inspired by the tale. Reverend Bull, the original and at this time only owner of the rectory, passed away in 1892. His son, Reverend Henry Harry Bull, took over the running of the rectory until his passing in 1928, leaving the rectory vacant. In 1929, Reverend Guy Eric Smith and his wife moved into Borley Rectory. While cleaning the home, Smith's wife came across an unusual package. Upon opening it, she discovered the skull of what was believed to be a young woman. There was no mention of the body's location or who the skull may have belonged to. Mrs. Smith would also report hearing the ringing of servants' bells, which had been disconnected, unexplained footsteps and lights shining in the windows. She also reported that she saw the phantom horse-drawn carriage that the Bell daughters had also seen. After unrelenting haunting events, the Smiths asked to be put in touch with the Society for Psychical Research in 1929, At this point, Harry Price was working with the SPR and was sent to investigate Borley Rectory, arriving on June 12. Harry Price was a paranormal investigator of sorts. He was known for exposing fraudulent cases of seances and hauntings and may have expected to do the same at the Borley Rectory. However, this case would become much more than he or anyone else could have expected. Upon Price's arrival, there were reports of new events, the throwing of stones, spirit messages tapped out on mirror frames in a code, as well as apparitions, lights flashing and unexplained footsteps. It appeared the spirit's presence was becoming more intense over time. However, when Price left the home, having completed his initial investigation, Reverend Smith's wife claimed she suspected Price had faked some of the events, for example, throwing the stones and pebbles about himself. The Smith's inhabitants of the home lasted less than a year, with the family vacating the property on July 14, 1929, though the property would not stay vacant for long. In 1930, Lionel Foster and his wife Mary Ann as well as their adopted daughter Adelaide, would move in. The family was immediately affected by the haunting. Lionel began to keep a log of strange events, which spanned the years 1930 to 1935. He noted the strange ringing of the disconnected servants' bells, stones being thrown, writings on the wall that read, Get Help, Marianne, and there was even an account of his daughter Adelaide being locked in a room with no key and being attacked by something horrible. Marianne reported that in addition to the writings on the wall, she had also once been thrown from her own bed. Foister decided to contact Harry Price to assist in the case. There were two exorcisms conducted on the home by Foister, both without success. During the first exorcism, a foister was struck on the shoulder with a large stone about the size of a fist. Researchers who later reviewed the case believed that the events may have been triggered unknowingly, or knowingly, by Marianne. 
Marianne, however, believed it was her husband who had been working with psychic researchers to fraudulently create some of the events. In an unusual twist, Marianne may have had some motive to cause these events herself, perhaps to distract from what she'd been doing behind closed doors. Marianne admitted that she had been having a sexual affair with a lodger, Frank Perlis, while living in Borley Rectory. And it's possible that the haunting was simply a cover. The Foisters left the Borley Rectory in October 1835. Price wished to continue his investigation, and so he took out a rental agreement on the property for a year, and on May 25, 1937, he ran an ad in the Times looking for researchers to live at the rectory and record any supernatural events. The advertisement was as follows. Haunted house. Responsible persons of leisure and intelligence, intrepid, critical and unbiased, are invited to join a rota of observers in a year's night and day investigation of alleged haunted house in home counties. Printed instructions supplied. Scientific training or ability to operate simple instruments an advantage. House situated in lonely hamlet, so own car is essential. Right box H989, The Times, EC4. As a result of this ad, he was able to engage 48 observers, mostly students, who would spend time at the now-empty rectory. He printed the first-ever handbook on how to undertake a paranormal investigation and handed one each to the participants. Some investigators brought their own equipment to the scene. Others worked strictly by the handbook. And over the next few years, there would be some notable events. In 1938, Helen Glanville conducted a seance in Streatham, South London, in order to contact spirits and shed light on the Borley Rectory. Price claimed that Helen made contact with two spirits. One of the spirits was a nun named Marie Lair. Marie communicated that she was a French nun who had left her convent and travelled to England. Her life came to an abrupt end a tragic end, when she was murdered and her body was thrown in the well or buried in the walls of it. This tale was very similar to the law about the bricked-in nun in the rectory walls. The second spirit Helen was able to contact called himself Sonnex Amures, and he warned that he would set fire to the Borley rectory on March 27, 1938, in order to reveal the bones of a murder victim resting beneath the structure. The fire did not take place that particular night, but it did occur the following year, and later on, in 1943, there would be a gruesome discovery, but not before some other suspicious events would take place. On the 27th of February 1939, new owner Captain W. H. Gregson who had taken ownership of the home, was unpacking when he knocked over an oil lamp, causing a fire to spread through and damage the rectory. In his own words from the article Borley Rectory, the most haunted house in England, he describes the experience as follows. I bought the rectory, which I then renamed Priory, in commemoration of its traditional origin, in full knowledge of its ghostly reputation and in complete scepticism. I have since found ample cause to admit that there are influences existing and active in and around the place, which are outside of the limits of what we are accustomed to consider normal. The disastrous fire at the rectory may have had some disturbing influence because during the night of the fire, several people report having seen me, accompanied by two strangers, one, a lady dressed in a grey cloak, the other, a gentleman with a sort of bald head dressed in a long black gown. Already, the fate of my two spaniels has been published and broadcast far and wide. How first wise old Peter, a five-year-old black cocker, and afterwards Joe, six-month-old cocker, showed their dread of the gloomy courtyard, 
how even during daylight they could scarcely be persuaded to enter it, and how each in turn went mad with the terror at something which they sensed beyond the threshold of the courtyard, and died mad. The insurance company that investigated the fire ultimately ruled it arson, which implies heavily that a lot of Gregson's testimony of the hauntings should be taken with a grain or perhaps a handful of salt. Years later, in 1943, Harry Price conducted a dig in the cellars of the rectory and did indeed discover the bones of a young woman. The bones were given a Christian burial, though the parish of Borley refused to hold the ceremony, being of the opinion the bones were not that of a young woman, but those of a pig. Surely it's not difficult to discriminate between the two. A report by the Society for Psychical Research, by this time Price's rival organisation, found that many of the phenomena that occurred at the rectory had indeed been faked by Price. Charles Sutton claimed that in 1929 he had found Price to have pockets filled with pebbles of all sizes during his investigation, which explained reports of rocks being thrown. Many other events were put down to natural occurrences, such as rats causing strange sounds in the house, that may have accounted for the footsteps. The writing on the wall directed to Marianne may have been done by Marianne herself. In fact, later in life, Marianne voiced a claim that she had not really seen any apparitions and believed the strange noises were just the wind, friends in the home, or admitted that she herself had taken to playing pranks on her husband. Many of Bull's 14 children, the original owners of the rectory, claimed to have been surprised that the house was considered haunted, having not experienced anything for themselves including not having heard of the nun from their own siblings. Robert Hastings attempted to defend Price against fraud accusations, as did many others, but they were unable to do so effectively, given the thorough investigation by the Society for Psychical Research. Unfortunately, the house was ultimately demolished in 1944, so we may never be able to investigate for ourselves though surely if there were spirits attached to the area, they may still linger on. If you visited the site or somewhere similar, I and my listeners would love to hear from you. You can contact me on social media at goodnightmare underscore s or via email at goodnightmare underscore s at outlook.com. I'll leave links to the research articles I used in this episode so that you can check out the full article from Gregson himself for yourself. Please rate, review and subscribe to Good Nightmare if you have time wherever you listen to podcasts. As always, stay tuned for a promo from another great podcast. And until next time, sweet dreams. Greetings, friends. I'm Lauren, and this is my husband, Isaac. Say hi, Isaac. Hi. Hi. About once a month, we read the same book and get together to talk about it. It's a book club for a couple. Couples Book Club. That's the name of the podcast. We alternate good books and hate reads. We nerd out about true crime and lament the bland mediocrity of Nicholas Sparks. It is all you could ever want in a book club, and you don't even have to read the book. Check out Couples Book Club wherever you get your podcasts. We're a a couple's book club